she sent me an email this morning, which didn't start with pure Moana, but started with pure Banana. <laughs> and suicide and I accepted the invitation to do that with, with some diffidence for, for two reasons really. Sometimes I think discussions about colonization have become a bit like discussions about the Treaty of Waitangi or discussions about poetry that you probably all endured when you were at school. I know when I was at school you had to do poetry. You learned nothing about the beauty of the words or the messages that the poets were trying to convey with their creativity. Instead you did poems to prepare for an exam. <coughs> and sometimes I fear the treaty has become like that. People go to treaty training and do the treaty. Government departments have one on the treaty. And I guess on your CV you took a box to say that you've done the treaty. But there's really, in my experience, in that doing of the treaty, any real analysis or consideration of what has actually happened to the treaty since 1840. And that what most people learn when they do the treaty is the crown story, the justification for the exercise of crown power over our people. And colonization sometimes is a bit like that too. We do colonization as some historical abstraction, as something that happened in the past, caused some hurt, caused what is now often grudgingly admitted as injustice, and the taking of land and so on. But very rarely is colonization discussed as an ongoing, a damaging and persistent injustice, an oppression that has not yet ended and which cannot, in the context of this conference, be divorced from suicide. And so with that in mind, I wasn't sure how to link the two together. So I thought I'd tell three stories about three different young people who took their own lives. Because in each case, quite different, although the tragic results were the same, the links between the now of that taking of a life and the now of colonization is so obvious and so painfully hurtful. The first instance is a real case, but one which was actually poetically fictionalized by the author Patricia Grace in her novel, Baby No Eyes. And if you take away any readings from this conference, and you haven't already done so, can I urge you to read Baby No Eyes. And as part of the story, she creates a character around the memories of one of her tipuna, and the character's young girl who she calls Riri Peti. 
Rudy PT, just like Patricia's real Tipona, grew up at the time when colonization was most savagely and most violently determined that our people should not speak their own language. And we sometimes do that history of the denial of the real, of how some people were punished for speaking the real. But that too has sometimes been abstracted and it's now been seen as a breach of the treaty and so on. <coughs> but the story of an any pity cuts through the abstraction to the pain that is done when you punish a child for speaking the only language that she knows. Because when Nidhi Piti started school, Māori was the only language she knew. So every time she opened her mouth, she was punished. And after the physical punishment, she was made to stand in a corner wearing a dunce's cap. Over time, she began to become so terrified that she had to be almost physically dragged to school. Sometimes when she couldn't speak and wanted to go to the toilet, she couldn't ask for being pun fear of being punished. So she would wet herself and be made again to stand in the corner. Eventually, at 10 years old, that little Māori girl took her life. And Patricia describes that taking in the following ways. Dirty Petty died, dead of school, killed by fear. What is it in the process of colonization that then and now continues to demean our language, continues to instill in too many of our people not just so much a fear of being punished for speaking the real, but a fear of being Māori that amidst all the talk of the Māori Renaissance and so on, there are still too many of our young people for whom being Māori remains a challenge. To understand the richness and complexity of their whakapapa and their history is for too many a journey too far. And often that journey ends as it did with Riddhi Petty and the taking of her life. The second story is particularly apt at the moment with the discussions about the abuse of children who are taken from Fano and placed in state institutions. Whenever I discuss that topic, I'm trying really hard not to use the word state care because it seems a crass contradiction of terms. This is the story of a 19-year-old boy who was taken from his father, who were classed as dysfunctional, and placed in the first of nine state institutions where he was regularly regularly and systematically physically and sexually abused when he eventually escaped from that care because he was deemed in the strange definitional fascination of park our law he was deemed to be too old to be in care. He left a shattered, broken, and unhappy young man who eventually unable any longer to carry the scars 
that had been inflicted upon him at 19 years old took his life. What is it about colonization that can create a system which equates children with really made victims? That equates the innocence of children with something to be besmirched and destroyed? What is it in a culture of oppression which then hides that abuse? or dismisses it as the work of perverted individuals rather than the systemic reality of colonization, which if it is anything else, is about destroying and besmirching the innocence of the peoples it seeks to destroy. And what is it about a government that after so much pressure decides that there will be an inquiry into the abuse of children. What is it about a government that says we will conduct that inquiry but we will exclude from it the abuse of children in church-run institutions? When a large proportion of the children who have been abused were abused in the so-called care of religious institutions. And what is it about a government that seeks to justify that by talking only of its responsibility?